Okay, we are live. Hi, everyone. I hope we are all doing great in these strange times. So until now, in this digital Cardiff Edge Games conference, we've seen some great presentations and speakings. Congratulations mm -hmm. to the organizer. I'm George Agarakis. I'm the founder of eGamers.io, a blockchain gaming portal established in the summer of 2018. With me today are some of the most brilliant people in the NFT space. But before we get to meet you and talk everything about non-fungible tokens and game economies, I have a question for you. What's coming first, guys? The vaccine or Ethereum 2.0? Let us know in the comments. So, clockwise turn, let's begin and meet our speakers for today, starting with Vladimiros. Vladimir, you have the word. Uh, nice to have you guys. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Like with some of you, we've talked through mail. With George, we also connected through Telegram. It's uh, kind of like uh, you, you have a handicap because I'm also Greek. So we managed to talk a little bit in Greek before, prior to the uh, conference. So I'm Vlad. I'm Saloniki. And uh, I'm behind Rare Candy 3D, which is basically a virtual publishing house for scarce physical and digital collectibles uh, uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. Great. So, Alex, you have the word. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex from Engine. Uh, I spoke earlier in the week, uh, so you might remember that Engine is a company which provides a suite of uh, tools and integrated product, uh, products allowing anyone to integrate blockchain into their projects um, and players to come along and hold blockchain assets and interact with these blockchain projects very easily. We're all about removing the friction from interaction with blockchain. And I'm head of uh, developer partnerships for Engine, so I oversee uh, outreach and also handling inbound in inquiries and oversee the uh, adoption program of our official engine adopters. Um, so sometimes I'll be talking all the depth of detail of blockchain technology and the experimentation. And later in the day, I'll be speaking to someone who's never come across blockchain before and uh, being reminded of how confusing this space can be. Incredible. Pretty so, interesting indeed. Philip, what about you? I'm Philippe. I'm a director of research at a company called Horizon Blockchain Games. We are currently building a game called Skyweaver, which is a TCG. And our goal really is with this game is uh, for it to be a Trojan horse, for people to, you know, play a game and earn assets without knowing their blockchain asset on, on Ethereum. And hopefully, you know, with that transition, players will discover the world of blockchain without first having... Uh, even the knowledge that they're using it. Um, yeah. That's good. They don't need to know that. They just have to play great games. Oh, that's a cool. So, yeah. Mr. Young. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Robbie Young. Uh, I'm the CEO of Animoca Brands. Um, we are a traditional mobile game business that um, I guess pivoted to really focus all our energy on blockchain games a few years ago. Um, and I think we've, you know, we've, we've tried to make ourselves known by working with everybody and anybody that we can in the space, because we really just believe in NFTs and, and the growth of blockchain and gaming. Um, so we have a couple of titles that you may be familiar with, um, the Sandbox, which is a, a metaverse project, um, as well as F1 Delta Time, which is one of, I think, still only a handful of, of licensed branded games in the market, at least outside of the football space, because football seems to be heavily licensed in <laughs> NFTs at the moment. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's one of a handful still of major licensed projects. And we've just recently added uh, MotoGP to that as well. Um, and we have, a, uh, we have a token across both of those games. So we've really tried to work with everybody in the business um, and see, you know, how the best way to bring the next billion players on board is. Um, and so I think um, I'm looking forward to talking with everybody about, about NFTs. That's great, Mr. Yang. Uh, indeed, Formula One and all that, all that, all that motorsports are a great fit in the blockchain gaming industry. So to begin with our questions, the question is simple. Why do games need non-fungible tokens? Would you care to answer, Mr. Young? <laughs> sure. Nope. Happy to. Um, I think 
the reason that you know we were really inspired, frankly, and this this credit has to go to the guys at, at Dapper, formerly Axiom Zen, because we got into blockchain gaming through working together with them on CryptoKitties um, to publish that in Asia, and it really inspired us to see what could be done putting blockchain technology into games. And we came up with a few really simple ideas, frankly. Um, simple ideas that are complicated to execute, but the ideas are simple, which is if you have the choice to own truly what's in your game, what you spend time modifying and building, you know, whether it's armies or cars or, or you know, buildings, it doesn't matter. You spend your time and it's your passion. Um, wouldn't you prefer to own it? Yes or no? And I think the answer is always yes. Um, and then the second part is when we think of, and so those are NFTs. Um, and then actually the other part, which is the slightly more fungible tokens, is when we come from a background of you know a decade in mobile, which is uh, pretty much all free to play, um, our focus has always been in app purchases. And we feel like games should be all tokenized um, in terms of their in-game currency, because we think this is a logical extension of providing all the benefits of blockchain technology in games. And people would much rather have an in-game currency that was um, uh, finite and secure, et cetera, rather than just buying diamonds or gold or something nebulous, which, which kind of has only a one-way transaction where you give the developer money and that's it. <laughs> so, so those were our two things. Um, and we thought everybody will like this. Um, and so far, you know, we've been working a few years on it and we're still trying to get it in the hands of everybody. So. That's awesome. Being a passionate gamer and my, myself, a passionate gamer, I think that's awesome. Uh, I think that uh, NFTs, like tokenizing in-game assets, whether that uh, that might be a sword or a vest or a helmet or whatever, it's important not just because the user, the actual player owns the item, but also because we create a, a history for each item uh, uh, respectively. Like, uh, for example, maybe there are a lot of A-type a swords, but one of these A-type swords was used five years ago by a superhero player to kill a specific boss and all that stuff, all this information, all this metadata is stored on chain and is uh, transparent to everyone to see. So I think even yes. uh, even items that may look the same, maybe it's not very, uh, you know, we're talking about an item that's not uh, basing its value on scarcity, but rather than history. So history creates uh, <clears throat> a level of rarity itself. I think that'll be really fascinating uh, in the esports space when you can actually buy a specific item held by a specific player used to win a big tournament. Um, yeah, the collectible nature of it could be could be one of an infinite number of uh, your magic swords. But if it's that specific one that has a, a specific history, then it's exactly. collectible. Um, I think in terms of the the question of do why do games need blockchain? I think um, you know a lot of games don't need blockchain, but they clearly benefit from it. But I think the urgency definitely comes into play when you look at players engaging with blockchain games and holding blockchain assets, uh, it's addictive. It's really, really nice. Uh, once, once you get that feeling of true ownership, um, being able to have a transparency of the scarcity of the items, then, then you just want to play more blockchain games. I think it's at that point that um, I probably would say, you know, games need, need blockchain because that's going to be what players will expect. Uh, and obviously we're very early stage here, um, but you already see sort of members of the engine community sharing other gaming projects they like. Um, and saying, well, I'll, be, I'll, I'll play it when it actually is like blockchain assets. <laughs> um, because we, yes, yes. It'll, be, it'll be understandable. And I, think, and I think one other feature of that too is, is the interoperability part because inter interoperability, um, or at least the promise of interoperability, um, I think just can possibly make games more fun in a way that it hasn't been, um, that hasn't been you know, possible previously. And I, I take a simple example, which we're working on in-house, which is just two motorsports games. And the idea that you could own, you know, a, a motorcycle, MotoGP NFT, but bring that motorcycle to race on an F1 track with F1 cars. And that's something that I think gamers have always loved to mash things up. And, um, and, and I think it just adds an extra layer of fun to the, to the product. Um, over and above the idea of ownership and speculating on value. It's just, these are my toys. I want to bring my toys around everywhere and show my friends. So now, can I go yeah, Robbie, 
Can I come in and be a devil's advocate then? The last for moderator, Go for so it. I'll try to act on the devil side. But when it comes to um, the side of having each item own their own history, right? Uh, there's definitely some cases where the item having being owned by a very famous player could be interesting. But I would assume that it perhaps 99.9% .9 of the times, the history of that item will be somewhat dull or uninteresting, right? And then it becomes a question of, if you got you have to go on the market and there's one million flame sword, and the only distinction for them is you'd have to investigate their story. How do you know which one to buy? How do you know which, how much you should <laughs> pay, right? To me, it's like, there's, um, I think there's definitely many, many use cases where the history could matter, but I, at the same time, I think there is a danger in trying to, f to focus on features that are that make the pricing of asset very difficult and it could be challenging for newcomers as as a question of yeah which 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 sword do i buy when there's a million of these okay. totally agree and and i think i'm hoping um in my optimistic version of capitalism that it will shake out because if you're a new ent a new player in a game you can always have the option to buy the sword you know freshly minted from from the developer Exactly. Or it's possible that you can go and buy a secondhand sword from some guy who's tired of playing the game and he sells it for 10 cents on the dollar. Um, and I think that's actually, I mean, a lot of our industry for, for this year, we're all, you know, very much focused on the value proposition of the fact that a lot of currently a lot of NFTs increase in value. Um, but I think the long term excitement for gamers really is just not that they necessarily make money but that they don't lose all their money. <laughs> so that once you're tired of playing a game that you've spent $100 on, maybe if you can get $5 back, that's $5 you don't get back today. And that's something. And I think if you can just move the needle that $5, then that's already, you know, that's that's $8 billion in mobile gaming. I think, I think uh, you're also just definitely add, a point of... Sorry, I don't know if we're live anymore. Just want to mention that, but it says we're on standby. Oh, it says for me we're live. Um, Same here. Can you guys hear me? Interesting. So dance like no one's watching, as they say. <laughs> yeah, uh, George, yeah, we hear you. Okay, so I had uh, internet disconnect. <laughs> Things not only table, as it seems. <laughs> okay, I, I think, great. Um, just in terms oh. of the, the discoverability factor of you know, all of these you know, millions of NFTs, how do you discover their history? I think definitely there's, there's huge advances that need to be made in kind of user interfaces and how to you know, display this information. But I think a, a lot is the is about the personal story that is meaningful to people and their assets. Um, but the story I, I like to give, which is you know, in the in the real world, um, my uh, my nephew, he's a teenager and he. Uh, uh, he lives in the States um, and there they collect sneakers like crazy. Um, he actually owns a pair of sneakers that were uh, worn by Travis Scott, um, managed to get them on a special drop. He never wears these sneakers because he would damage them. So he can't actually show them off to anyone. He can't prove that they were owned by Travis Scott, but you know, his close circle know that that's the case. And I think that's the same with these, these crypto collectibles. It's the ability to, you know, to the people who care, you can prove it to them on the blockchain. And then we'll build better interfaces around that. But the fact that you can trace the provenance of items um, provably right now, and you can, you, know, you can then sell on your items and be able to prove that history, uh, the, the roads are already laid to kind of work with that. Um, and obviously in the sneaker realm, we're seeing uh, people look at the ability to track and trace and prove with um, blockchain assets anyway. Um, yeah, if I remember correctly, I think Wax actually has a partner that's doing that, um, where they're tokenizing the ownership of the of the sneakers essentially, so that you don't basically it's a it's a it's a receivable basically for the sneakers because they sit in a warehouse somewhere and you trade the tokens back and forth until somebody actually wants to wear the sneakers at some point and then they trade in their token for the sneakers. Yeah, it's like a, so you basically a trade the ownership contract, and then when someone wants to redeem it, he can. Uh, we can use shipping and everything. All these costs involved with changing physical items just once. Yes, exactly. That's crazy. Well, yep. you okay. guys have probably heard it's not NFT per se, but the Uniswap sucks. Probably heard of this, right? <laughs> Definitely, man. They are the reason we have so outrageous fees. Definitely. They are. Yeah. So you could you could have bought them and have them delivered. 
but they are not <laughs> NFTs. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to add to what Alexander mentioned with the sneakers. Like I think that uh, you know, the, uh, regardless of the scarcity of an item, we can see this kind of models even in uh, Steam. Like you don't have to need blockchain for this. Like you see items that maybe they have like a scarcity of millions, yet some specific items like this specific boot or this specific skin was used from a miracle or some other uh, fancy player who won the championship, and then this this skin. Uh, gets this history, it's like signed by this person uh, in partnership with Steam, so they can somehow verify it, maybe not in a blockchain way, it's more of a centralized way where they verify the teams that, uh, no, I can't sign a, a collectible on Steam myself, but uh, popular teams, popular players, especially those who win tournaments, obviously do. And these items, even if they are identical to a, a hundred million other uh, items uh, that look alike, uh, they still will be more expensive in Steam, whether we have blockchain or not. I think this is something that it's a psychological marketing uh, for uh, for users, you know, for collectors, mostly for collectors, not so much for welcome, players. Welcome, Alex. I see Alex. Hey, guys. In the panel. Hi, hey, there. man. Welcome. Sorry about the How are you? Lots of issues. Finally, I'm... No stress, man. Hope you're worry. good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. We, we were... Perfect. We were talking about... Uh, the NFTs and why games need NFTs. So, since you are on OpenSea, I guess your opinion is valuable for us. On what part about NFTs? About the non fungible tokens and why does games need non fungible tokens? Oh, games, I mean, um, I don't think games need non fungible tokens. There are many games that don't have assets. But I'd say that if you have a game where you want assets to have value to players, and if that value is part of the like reason you want users to play your game, then you need non-fungible tokens. And that's because in in a sort of fundamental sense, like centralized assets only live as long as the game does. And people's valuing valuation of those assets is limited to like how much they trust this game to last um something like sure, yes. mm -hmm. yeah they'll make tons of games like maybe my assets will be valuable in in their other games uh they have you know blizzard is an exception it's these it's the indie games it's the long tail where you don't know how to value the assets at all because you don't know how long the game's gonna last you don't know who's playing it you don't know like how much their runway is you don't know anything about it. So why really value the stuff that I'm doing? Like my time is is basic. All I'm getting out of it is like the entertainment value. I'm not like investing any of my time somewhere that's going to accrue in value. So that's what NFTs give the gaming industry. It's finally hope for the long tail to actually provide meaningful value to users who play with them. Okay, perfect. So, to move on to our next topic, uh, I would like to discuss how can we solve the onboarding barriers for non-fungible tokens and, of course, games and collectibles. Well, Alex from Engine, would you like to begin with this question since I'm familiar with Engine and I know how much you guys are doing for the collectible side? Uh, well, certainly. we huge focus at engine is removing the friction obviously for game developers who want to interact with blockchain we do the heavy lifting of you know blockchain code and smart contracts um but on the on the player side on your sort of everyday user again it's about you removing the friction allowing people to be on board with projects very easily so one of our main products engine beam is the ability to generate a qr code place your nfts behind that and then you have that uh, qr code in a game stream or in distributed in an email, and users can scan that QR code, receive an item, choose to claim it, and be onboarded to the sort of blockchain ecosystem and your project through, through that path. Um, and a lot of the kind of improvement on that onboarding process came through our work uh, you know, with Microsoft, creating these uh, digital collectible NFTs, uh, these Azure Hero badges, um, and working with them to provide a way to you know, quickly acknowledge and reward people and give them a way to sort of enter this ecosystem for the first time. Um, huge amount of lessons learned there. But I think there's the, the bigger piece of friction is really the education side of this. It's you know, why should users kind of choose that opt-in path? Mm -hmm. What are the benefits here? Once they have the blockchain assets, where can they take it? 
take them. Um, you know, Marketplaces are an amazing kind of discovery tool for other projects and new NFTs, as I'm sure Alex is aware. Um, but at the same time, how do you discover that these marketplaces are out there? How do you um, find out how to list and move your um, assets around when you've never had that true ownership experience before? So, I, so for me, I think education is a, is a huge factor here. And that kind of comes back to the, the very first point about the experience is addictive when uh, when you get used to this and you understand the value proposition, you just want you know, more. You want to engage with NFTs and blockchain assets even more. Uh, so I think that education hurdle is the big part because then people are absolutely hooked. Okay, well, education is uh, absolutely important, but uh, should we really educate the users? Should it, shouldn't we create platforms that make it very ordinary, as simple as it goes? I mean, if I get my little brother to get him understand how to use non-fungible tokens and send this to that Ethereum address, don't send Bitcoin there, you're going to lose it and all that stuff, you're getting crazy. It's, it's for geeks. It's for blockchainers. I mean... I totally agree here, George. And I think that uh, I recently had a conversation with Eva Kaili, which is a European Parliament member. She's actually pushing blockchain into, in, into the EU Commission, let's say. And uh, she said something pretty interesting. We were talking about when blockchain adoption comes. And this is not subject only to NFTs. This is uh, about the broader ecosystem. And she told me that... Do you think that when uh, somebody, even uh, if you go and pay, let's say, for your coffee with your visa, do you think that people who use this visa, they understand what kind of encryption visa uses? Where are visa servers? How the, the POS uh, machines work? No. What they care about is swiping the card and getting their coffee. And I think cryptos won't become mainstream because people will eventually start to realize how blockchain technology wor works or why it is so beneficial but only when they will start to utilize it without realizing it. They will start to swipe their mobile phones instead of their card. They will start to use QR codes instead of uh, receipts and everything like this. And if a user is experienced, like if somebody wants to go deeper, he will still be able to see what's happening behind the Web3 scene. But I think for the regular, for the casual user, we don't have to promote, <clears throat> I'm sorry, terms like blockchain and crypto and label everything uh, around this, uh, let's say, hot, hot, uh, hot words. Absolutely, absolutely. Mr. Young, since you are leading mm. Animoga brands and you have a... a mm, wide collection of games i can say what are you doing yes. to onboard regular gamers into the blockchain gaming ecosystem so i think we're we're taking this from two fronts on the first side we're trying as best as we can to make the onboarding experience be much more similar to a game people are accustomed to you know when making mobile games the focus had always been once you click download in the app store, how many more clicks is it for you to actually buy something in the game from the moment you pop the right. game open? You know, how many help screens are there? How, you know, how fast is that process? Because every click you cut um, is a good thing if you can make it very easy for people to, to get through. Um, the tricky part on blockchain, of course, is that we have wallets and there's, there are many other steps. I think we're trying to take the approach that people can just show up with a credit card and buy something. And so we're working currently with partners to provide some of those services because um, you need at the moment to basically be a, um, a, a, a currency, you know, currency trader essentially and have people available to pay in Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and all kinds of whether they want to pay in euros or use their visa card. All those options need to be up to the user because it's not their job to have the right money to pay for the product, you know, if you want them to pay. It's your job to make sure that you offer the service to them. So I think that has some overhead to it, obviously, because we need to pay fees to all of those services, which is fine. Um, but I think that's one aspect. The second aspect is we're trying to work with the type of types of game content that hopefully are very familiar to gamers, which is why we chose to work with brands like Formula One and MotoGP, um, because we know that there's already a very large fan base and audience there. Um, there's a large gamer base who plays, you know, the console Formula One games that Codemasters makes, for example. Um, so because there's a great fan base, 
hopefully we can appeal to that fan base to now try another Formula One experience in addition to the ones that they already enjoy. Um, so I think we've taken that approach from a marketing standpoint. Um, at the same time, we also try to put features in the game that hopefully will appeal to people who are already very crypto native. So for example, we just launched the ability to stake your Formula One cars in the game because crypto natives like yield. Yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so if, if we can add that to the in-game economy as a feature just for that particular audience, then it, hopefully there's a little something for everybody. They are getting the rev tokens by staking the, the cars. Correct. Tokens. Yes, that's All correct. Right. All right. Uh, anyone else has something to say regarding the onboarding? Uh, I think um, Go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to add that I just want to say that, you know, it's totally possible today on Ethereum to, to build an experience for user that is not really distinguishable from traditional games, right? You can abstract away gas fees. You can abstract away most of the wallet, can abstract away most of the com complication of transactions or approvals and whatnot. Um, so there's definitely ways and a lot of technological progress has been made to abstract a lot of that complexity. And it's just a question of time before all the things that we complain about in terms of user experience go away. No, it's not a fundamental challenge. It's mostly a technical challenge at this point. The last hurdle really when it comes to user adoption and, and onboarding is really transaction fees. Uh, at this point, you know, there's uh, the the main solutions are to use side chains that are EVM compatible if you're interested in, in Ethereum uh, blockchain. Otherwise, there's definitely other chains that are popping up. There's layer two solutions that are becoming more and more interesting for, for blockchain games. Uh, and But this will take a bit more time for it to reach uh, maturity. And, but here it's really a question of trade-offs when it comes to if you don't want your users to pay for transaction fees, which is totally possible to if you use a, a side chain, for example, to Ethereum. Uh, well, you're, you're compromising somewhere, it's likely on security, right? If you wanna, don't wanna compromise on security because your assets are worth tens of thousands of dollars, then maybe you can afford uh, having the users pay for tran higher transaction fees and stay on Ethereum. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm personally very excited because I, I don't think the UX challenge that we're discussing today will remain for long. Um, okay, great. Yep, agree. So the agree. next is... Please, anyone? Okay. So the uh, discussion topic is about interoperability between games. I know many of you are familiar with this. It's having one item and being able to play with this exact item in another game. For example, I've been an avid gamer for my whole life. I've been playing like Lineage 2 for, I don't know, 12 years. I've been playing a lot of that game. So if that game was on the blockchain, if I had that items in that game, I could take that items to another game, or at least I could sell that items. So who would like to start? Alex, would you like to start? Which Alex? Alex, Alex Rusman, Alex. since I know the gaming multiverse from Engine, this is something that you guys are already doing. Yeah, so the, I mean, the Engine Multiverse project, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, um, Engine has created a set of you know, blockchain assets that exist on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and we haven't really, we haven't created our own game for those, but they're supported by many of our Engine Adopter games. So, for example, there's the Stormwall um, Shield NFT, which can be used um, across several different games. Um, in some, it's a, a more kind of true to form fantasy medieval shield, and in others, it's a sci-fi laser shield. Um, so, so I think that's that's the sort of scenario you're describing, George, where you you have an item that impacts gameplay and you take it to another game and it also impacts the gameplay there. And it's true to form. So a, a shield is roughly resembles a shield. Um, a lot of a lot of the time, because um, interoperability in this way is a big value proposition. Game developers say to me, "But this, this is going to break a game. How do I take a?" You know, a, a spaceship into a fantasy RPG, and I, I say, well, it could be the fortress spaceship uh, that then is a medieval fortress in another game. But um, 
while, while that is interesting, perhaps more from a perspective of you know, cross-game questing, I would say, why do you want to take um, an item from virtual world to virtual world? Um, on the one hand, it, it might be that virtual quest leveling up across games. Uh, but for me, I think the what will impact will be most impactful to most players will be carrying their identity and achievements between games. It's about going to another virtual world and having your past accomplishments acknowledged. And that doesn't need to be in an item that's going to impact gameplay because I don't necessarily want to rock up at a new game and already have a sword that you means I effectively ignore the first 10 levels. I don't have that fear and trepidation of going into a new dungeon. So for me, I want to you know, arrive in a virtual world and be acknowledged as, ah, you were this past great lord or past great conqueror um, and have my virtual identity carry around with me. It's not left behind in some walled garden. Um, and the first time I really realized that was when I downloaded one of the engine adopter games, Lost Relics, and I played it before that said, basically said, hello, Alex. Oh, you've collected the, the dragon riders of Cryptomats. So you have a pet dragon. Oh, you have an engine multiverse sword. And it was like coming home to a world I'd never been before. And that was a really, really awesome experience. And I think carrying your identity in that way between virtual worlds, that's going to be the thing that um, you know, really drives a lot of adoption. And the inter interoperability um, aspect that will come before we see you know, cross-game questing, which obviously requires a lot more interaction between economies and projects. Sure. Uh, Alex, being a gamer myself, I think that uh, interoperability is a pretty important aspect uh, among uh, cross-game uh, in interactions, but I think that focusing on item interoperability would be very difficult, if not uh, impossible, if you are talking about different brands that have nothing to do with each other. For example, if you take a single company like you mentioned prior to that, like Blizzard or maybe Tencent or something like this, and all of their games understand the logic behind an item that's minted from the from the specific company. Maybe that's possible, but in other scenarios, if I get an item from Blizzard to a Tencent game, at the stats, the characteristics of the item might not even fit the concept, not just the storyline, like getting a spaceship into a fantasy world, but I mean, not even the, it would be totally unbalanced. But uh, I propose, and I think that if we, uh, manage to somehow create a universal gaming token or something like this uh, that would translate the value of each item uh, regardless of the platform regardless of the game uh, transfer uh, you know translates somehow like a coin market cap for different types of uh, monetary value or items from different games and so that a player uh, like George mentioned I'm, I was also a lineage player and when I played a lot and I get rid of Lineage, I didn't want it to play anymore, like I was stuffed with it and I wanted to change to Elder Scrolls or something else, I, I couldn't get all this experience, all my work uh, from this game to, to the other realm. Of course, I wouldn't like to take my Lineage items because new items from Elder Scrolls are even better or maybe I want to try something different. But if I could uh, liquidify all my items and all my gold in Lineage, whether that's Adena or whatever currency they have, and I could trade it to a universal gaming token, and with that universal gaming token buy, essentially buy my way in into an, an, another game, a new game I'm trying to start, I think that would be more viable for, uh, for everyone and more specifically for companies that are building these games. Well, that's the most common scenario right now. I mean, we don't have a universal gaming token, but you can sell your items for Ethereum or Tron or whatever it is, whatever chain is on, and go buy something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, anyone would like to speak about the interoperability? Uh, well, I would like to add that I also think that you know it's it's Please. it's kind of in my opinion it's probably uh, overpromised. You know, like the having fully interoperable assets between all game uh i would assume that most game would end up like soups and very similar to one another if you could just port all the assets to one another i think if it just came to cosmetics and it was purely for cosmetic aspect that could be a lot more easier right but there are some, yeah, you have a point. there are some subset of games where interoperability works like if you think of something like ready player one experience or decentraland or you know there's no real gameplay other than building a universe on its own i think that place is very it's great for interoperability but if you're trying to build a competitive game like csgo or modern warfare or whatever game i i just can't imagine 
this game did, wanting to break the integrity of of the gameplay for respecting the uh, for for just designing even designing a game in a way that accounts for all possible assets that other games might develop is uh, is an impossible space to design in. I think it's it's very difficult. Uh, so, Philippe, now, now, now it's my turn to All be right. devil's advocate. <laughs> so, I, I think interoperability will also will come not necessarily as something that is um, that we're all interoperable, full stop. I, I think it will be a feature in order to tr to attract business and customers, and and this is part of our general sort of house thesis that that the the content will be the platform, because the way I see it, if let's just say hypothetically, we sell tons of F1 cars. So there's a huge player base of people who own F1 cars. Then you might want to make a track to attract all my players to go and drive on your track instead. And so you'll make it interoperable with my F1 cars because you want the business. And I think that's actually what's going to drive interoperability. I, I, Pretty interesting. I, I totally agree with what... And to add to it, it's, I don't think it's just going to be indie developers who try to bootstrap an audience off of major games by doing what you just said. I think after that becomes more of a norm, we could see major games partnering with major games to do the same because it's a really mm. like obvious partnership. If I say that my Founders Pass... Uh, you can get a Founders Pass if you have a Founders Pass for another game that is already popular. Yep. But I drive demand to buy the Founders Passes in that other game, and I acquire the audience of that other game. So it's a it's a mutual, like really good uh, symbiotic relationship that you get out of it. Perfect. You're just enlarging the walled garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. So to move to our next discussion subject, uh, which is about the in-game economy. So most of you here are game developers, you run studios. So you know what does it take to create a good economy? So what does it take to create a balanced economy that both developers and players will earn in a decentralized way? on the blockchain. Who would like to start? <laughs> I know it's a tough question. We need hours to I, I can speak kick off from, this one. From the perspective of uh, the, the engine platforms designed to empower game developers. Um, so obviously, for, if you're a game developer, you might be hearing about these assets that travel all around the rails of Ethereum and land on amazing marketplaces like Alex's OpenSea. And you're thinking, okay, well, that's good for players, but then they're just you're selling assets and I'm not benefiting. And the engine platform allows digital creators for the very first time program into these assets transfer fees. So every change in ownership um, necessitates a payment to the digital creator. So for the first time, digital creators actually are incentivized to see this second secondhand marketplace activity. Um, and they're being rewarded for people gifting items to their friends from peer-to-peer -peer trade, from trade on OpenSea, et cetera. Um, so I think that that's a way to really empower game developers um, and to you know, help them benefit in this situation as well. How do you prevent people from building a, a proxy system or like a wrapper to, their, to these tokens that would skip the transfer fee? Like the way I see it is, if there is fee embedded in the token transfers, I can just wrap these tokens, create new tokens that basically are one to one exchangeable with the asset tokens, and these wouldn't have the transfer fee. Um, well, we've we haven't seen that so far. I think I think also there. Then you just come up with preventive measures to uh, not. Uh, acknowledge those assets. I know that has been that has been something that's been discussed several times. You have ways of you know, bypassing these high value assets, um, but if that's the case, it's just a matter of you know seeing how those solutions are implemented and then um, you're putting up walls against them. Um, but in, in the in the same way, uh, people say, well, can't we just look at a smart contract and create the same items and magic up items for other games? Um, in practice, it's not that simple. Philip. <laughs> Would, would you mind to guide us through the Skyweaver economy? Sure. Well, what can players can do? 
Yeah. If I start playing, can I make money? Am I, I allowed well, legally to say that? I don't know. So I'll, I'll <laughs> wait to the, uh, to the question of how to build a good in-game economy, how it relates to Skyriver. So we ha haven't released the Skyriver economy yet publicly, but in general, I think when it comes to building a proper secure economy, uh, one of the most important as aspects would be preventing things like hyperinflation. And, you know, like uh, the, ensuring yeah. that the assets in the game feel authentic, uh, they're secure in terms of their financial value. Uh, and in general, not, and I, I really think there's a, it's very early days in terms of building economies to, when it comes to, um, to uh, using technology like blockchain. Uh, there've, there's been many economies in the past in gaming. Economies in games is not new, right? There's super interesting economies. If you look at EVE Online, and if you look at uh, Ex Exordia, or even WoW has some very interesting stories. Um, but one thing that I'm personally interested in is, uh, if you look at how assets are created, most of the games try to sell them, or they have some sort of aspect where players can harvest, mine, or you know, go on planets and get the resources from there. But I think uh, one part where the blockchain space has, has taught a great lesson for uh, player-driven or user-driven economies is uh, a nice way that is secured to produce assets is by having a finite number of assets available and create a competition between the users to earn these assets. So if you look at Ethereum, block, uh, Bitcoin, even yield farming today, is all the same component where there's a finite number of resources per X number of time, right? So it's uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum is there's an asset that is created, Bitcoin rewards or Ether, Ether uh, rewards every block, uh, where the yield farming it's every second, there's X number or every block, there's X number of assets that are created and the players compete and the users compete in order to who's gonna get the rewards and how these rewards will be distributed. And that has been a very powerful way of creating assets that are not prone to hyperinflation uh, and that can that that engage basically the participants in their own way. Now, how that does that we can convert that to the users uh, and in games. That's a different question because we don't necessarily want it to be Wells game per se, right? So, is there a way that you can create assets by uh, making players compete with one another to produce these assets over time? I think that's a really interesting design space to explore for for blockchain games. But I can also f really foresee that there are ways to incorporate more traditional uh, centralized fine uh, block, uh, games uh, economy concept that I can could, could fairly well integrate with blockchains. Blockchain, even if you don't have a fully um, a fully hyperinflation protected economy, I think blockchain still provides a lot of interesting aspects uh, to to in game economies. Definitely, definitely. So, Mr. Yang, you have created more successful yes. games that I can count. So, can you give us some hints or tips? Oh, flattery will <laughs> get you everywhere. For um, in-game economy. So, I, I think, I, I think there's, there's no magic to in-game economies, but I think one of the things that was a very quick lesson for us coming from sort of traditional gaming into blockchain gaming was that we actually found ourselves in need of a real economist. Yes, <laughs> because building an in, building an in-game economy where where you actually just keep making money and trying to sell as much money to customers to spend in your game as possible is completely different than when you have to think about problems like inflation and money supply and, you know, macroeconomics essentially. Um, I think this adds a level of complexity so that we end up with you know, you can call it a, I mean, it is literally an economy, but it's also another form of metagame to put it in, in gamers language or developers language. So I think what we're doing in blockchain games by adding this type of robustness to the in-game economies is essentially adding more layers of metagames because players are coming to our games to spend time, enjoying their time, but they're also coming to you know spend money on items that they can personalize or have a more success in working their way up the leaderboards or they might be coming because they think that it's a good investment because for example they're a big formula one fan and they've collected every lewis hamilton helmet and so they want to have the nft helmet also in addition to the physical helmet that they own um so players it it, it was a real challenge for us 
because where we had to previously do 10 things, we now have to do 15 things. And, and I think that's the easiest way to think about it, which is why, honestly, it's taken us a couple of years to get to the point where we feel like, you know, our games, our initial games are really ready to go out to the market. Okay. I remember uh, a few years ago, I read an article that Valve, Steam, hired uh, Greece ex-Minister of Economy, Mr. Varoufakis, to supervise the in-game economies there. So I do well understand if, an, if I'm not uh, an economist of that, that uh, <laughs> running an in-game economy is a very rush job to do. So, yes. Okay. So uh, before we skip uh, to our next question, uh, Alex, would you mind telling us from the open sea what are some of the most top selling games or NFT projects? Where do you think it's, made it? it? It really changes quite frequently. Like the space is, is still small and it's moving really fast. Um, right now, Polyant Games is making an access token for its users that they're launching like a, a product for viewing your token balances and doing trades. And uh, we're seeing activity there. There's a project called Meme that started out as a joke, but it's, it's like an like economic meme, yeah. And you, uh, <laughs> they have their own token, and when you stake that token, which in turn boosts the liquidity for the whole uh, ecosystem around their token, then they then you earn collectible cards, trading cards that have like really good art. And these cards have innate value, so people trade them. Um, and the meme project has like shown that there's like a pretty clear way of integrating DeFi with NFTs. Uh, there's also there's another way of farming with NFTs. Farming is this term for mixing fungible tokens and, and non fungible tokens in this like uh, cooperative manner. Uh, like Robbie mentioned for F1 Delta Time. You can also stake NFTs and earn a fungible currency as a reward. So the community right now is very much into that. Um, we're also seeing a good amount of trades, a good amount of art volume, because artists now have a really easy way of just starting a mini career for themselves without having to like ship paintings to weird parts of the world or deal with payment trust issues or anything like that. Um, they can take digital art that they're good at making and just sell it. And the the flywheel for doing this has been gradually improving over time. Lots of art platforms are kind of hopping on board, but the artists that are coming in are also helping the gaming industry by increasing the number of buyers in the space. Hope that answers the question. Great. So to move to our next question, what do you guys prefer? Do you prefer hybrid games or dubs? What's the future? Is it going to be partially decentralized, the economy on the blockchain and the game on the traditional servers, or we are going fully decentralized? So who would like to begin? That's a tough one. Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, I would say I'm in favor of hybrid games. I don't know why, but it sounds interesting the way you have a central game that developers can create the game just like they used to and just mm -hmm. use the, the economy on the blockchain as long as we can prevent cheating, for example, on the centralized side. So is that possible? So no. keep, I'll give you a, a mobile game analogy um, when we first started making well probably for the first five years of making mobile games one of the biggest things about distributing mobile games that we really focused on was making sure that the game was less than 50 megs because as long as it was less than 50 megs people in pretty much every country in the world would download it and so for all those studios that were making triple a style titles that you had to download 950 ahead they had very limited distribution. And I think this is going to be one of those similar issues where if the decentralized technology is smooth enough 
at that point where we can actually have the kind of speed that's required for gaming, then I don't think anybody's going to doubt that everything should be decentralized. Um, but I think until that happens, there are always going to be hybrid solutions because we're just trying to solve problems. Well, yes. I mean, blockchain is not exactly ready. You can have a fully decentralized game on most chains. There are some chains like Zaya, for example, mm. who can, can actually do that stuff. But still, all this technology needs a lot of work. Uh, so, Alex, uh, Alex Rusman, engine uses hybrid games, right? Yes, we, we allow uh, game developers to come along and place, uh, create their game items as blockchain assets uh, really very quickly. Uh, one of our doctors, uh, the Six Dragons, um, Savas over there, he, he got lost. He fell down the rabbit hole of uh, blockchain and spent 48 hours doing a working engine integration with, with live crafting and enchanting on the blockchain. Um, so I, I think this, this kind of ties into the, the adoption point in terms of giving people an entry point to kind of play with the technology to you know, start integrating blockchain assets, have perhaps you know, a founders collectible for their core community to sort of engage around, uh, perhaps create a few sort of collectible cosmetics um, to sort of touch their toe in the water. And then from there, it's, it's, it's really a very sort of smooth learning curve and you see all sorts of advanced solutions being, being built. Um, and th this is really the exciting part. We, we've learned that we have to you know, give people the tools to do all the creative, innovative things that we couldn't predict on our side. Um, and that's why it's such a pleasure to work with this group of more than 30 teams and seeing what they build and what they demand of the engine platform and uh, you know, blockchain as a service platform um, in achieving their kind of vision there. Alex, can, that, we, so, <laughs> can we secure that what happens on the centralized server won't affect the blockchain side for example since you talked about Savas, who has the six dragons uh, a few months ago they integrated a service from Chainlink. i think it's called uh, on chain verified randomness i'm not sure uh this, this time from, yes, the, 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 the vrf, the VRF right so this kind of uh tools can they help centralized games to be more transparent because if it's centralized and I'm an admin, I can do whatever I want. I can give you a weapon and if you craft that one, if I give you the recipe and you go craft it on the blockchain. So what's the point of having the economy of the blockchain when we can hack the game? I think this comes down to the question of trust and transparency. Um, certainly with these high value assets, when we've seen sort of pre-sales or sort of randomized uh, distributions, um, I, loot boxes as well is always a is always a big topic in the in the gaming industry. Um, we've definitely seen cases where these random because because it is random, uh, someone will get a high number of high value NFTs, and everyone else will kind of look at that and say, "Wait, is there something? Um, you know, how how do we prove this was random? How do we not? How do we know that this wasn't exactly. favoritism?" So I think a, a solution like VRF is is really great in that situation where there there is the doubt about the trust. Um, but I think at the same time, putting everything on the blockchain is, as, as Robbie was saying, you need economists to really kind of look at all the permutations uh, that can take place. And if you're locked into a solution, but you can't change, you need to kind of migrate to a version three or version four to have um, a working uh, game. Then I think we're going to see a lot of gaming economies broken before um, a, a working solution or working complex solution is seen here. I guess the, the question would be, uh, should... Vitalik's uh, Warlock uh, Siphon Life spell uh, have just been left as it was? Or was that a game-breaking uh, spell that he was very fond of, but you, know, it, it, you needed this uh, young boy to be brought to tears uh, in order to bring balance to the game? I think that's, that's always going to be um, an element uh, to the question there. Um, but it's a learning process. We're in the really, really early stage of building new virtual economies. Um, but I think the transparency is really important uh, to come back to a, a kind of a cosmetics case you saw with Fortnite, they had this limited edition Halloween collectible skin. It was a sort of skeleton. Um, and people who had that skin wore it all the time because it was very rare and it was very limited. Um, and then they re-released it and you had, you were logging into games and everyone was running around wearing this skeleton skin. <laughs> um, and the great thing about blockchain is it, it provides a sort of dialogue between game developers and the players. It's kind of about making promises 
And if you go back on the promises, there's the proof that you made the original promises. There's the proof that you've backtracked or you've changed things. And I think that sort of dialogue and that sort of trust between two parties who don't communicate so often, that's going to lead to very interesting narratives and implementations of gameplay and game creation. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alex. So, uh, Philip, Skyweaver is, is a dub or a hybrid game? Uh, it's definitely a hybrid right now because, like, to go full extreme decentralized game, uh, I don't think there's a lot of options, but open sourcing your game. You need, and that's usually true for any open source or decentralized applications, but you need to have players be able to validate the outcome of games. You need to be uh, able for them to not only maybe watching videos could be sufficient, um, but I think the easiest and also the riskiest for having true decentralized game would be allowing third parties and players to run themselves a client and execute the code, verify the code, and be able to replay any action that happened in the game uh, and yeah, verify the outcome. That would be one way that it, probably the easiest, but also the riskiest way to decentralize game. And, and until then, though, uh, for us, Skyweaver is still a closed source game, but every action in the game is signed by a private key. Uh, with the intent that in the future we could make it something where if you were running the game and if the game was open source, any person in the world could verify the outcome of a game. To which extent we could make tournaments, we could make the economy fully uh, coming from the gameplay itself and everybody could verify that uh, the economy is, fil uh, is uh, fulfilling or, or um, following the rules of the game that w and how it was implemented. And I think when it also comes to, you know, um, something that uh, Alexander mentioned earlier, where uh, it's true that if the economy was fully decentralized and the game was fully decentralized, how do we ensure that the game is well designed? How do you ensure that the economy doesn't break? I think at least in terms of the economy, uh, there's definitely been a lot of very interesting experiments in the last six months when it comes to decentralized finance, where the users and the owner of the tokens have full control of what's going on. Like technically, for example, this this uh, YFI project or Wi-Fi project um, by Android. One of the interesting aspects is technically, for a long time, uh, this the supply was capped at something like I think it was twenty one thousand. Uh, but there was no, there was nothing preventing further minting if the community agreed to mint more. So technically, the community would have had the option, the, the, the users that held that token would have had the option to increase the supply, but they didn't, right? They could even have the option of banning the usage of that burn function. And I think in the future, there's definitely going to be experiments in the gaming space where the economy of the game will be left in the hand of the players. Uh, and there's an incentive for players not to break their own economy, right? And I think at that point, the same way, like there could be an incentive for players not to break the, the, the game design of their game in the first place, right? So I think uh, not to say this is easy, not to say this is going to happen anytime soon, but, you know, I'm really excited to see some of these experiments pan out in the next two to five years. I think there's going to be some interesting stuff. Well, definitely. We're going to see a lot of stuff in the next years. Okay. So, uh, Robbie. Do you prefer hmm. hybrid or do you prefer fully decentralized? Um, I, I think we're definitely on the on the hybrid bandwagon. Um, I think especially just because of latency issues. And I think for us, our focus is on, you know, it's, it's gameplay on the one hand, which is the part that we still do in the sort of traditional game server centralized fashion. But I think it's people are mainly concerned at this point in time with um, their ownership of digital items being decentralized. And I think that's really the focus is to make sure that that ownership trail is fully decentralized. Um, but for actual gameplay itself, I'm not sure that players care. Okay, thank you. So to move to our next question, uh, which is what are developers doing to attract players from both traditional gaming and blockchain gaming? Um, Robbie, would you like to start with this one since you sure. have both blockchain and regular games? Sure. Um, I think, as I alluded to earlier, I mean, our strategy for years and years has always been to work with brands. It's why it's in the name of our company, um, because we're, you know, licensing third party brands is, has been a theme for us always. And so we've always used that 
partnering with well-known brands as a way to market our products. Um, and that, you know, is true just as much now in, in blockchain games as it was when we were solely focused on mobile. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely part of it. I think the other part is to try to build in features that, you know, where there, as I said earlier, there's something for everybody. So, you know, build in features that are expected by the crypto community in blockchain games today, because those are the main players, um, but also try to make the onboarding simple enough that if you're not a crypto native, um, you can just show up because you heard there's a cool game there, or you responded to a marketing campaign on, you know, some user acquisition channel, and, uh, and then you can try out the game and, and it looks cool. So I think we always have to put on two different hats when we're thinking about whether the game, um, how it will appeal to users. We put on the hat of somebody who knows nothing about blockchain and we put on the hat of the hardcore crypto person because I think we actually need to satisfy both at the moment if we want to have a decent revenue base in the short term. Definitely. I mean, the blockchain gaming community is relatively small. So obviously, we need to bring on board the traditional gamers. Okay, so uh, Alex, would you mind telling us about Engine and how you guys are bringing the gamers on your platform and your games? Well, I think it's the same. Uh... It's the same as being a sort of normal game developer in a way. You you create an engaging experience that people want to to try, and then they get sucked into that, and you market it um, in a way that makes a, makes a project worth engaging with. So, most excitingly, I guess, uh, or most recently, we saw um, our first adopter actually, War of Crypto, um, do a soft launch on iOS, and they work a lot with influencers. Uh, so their launch YouTube video for that game uh, reached more than uh, a million views within 24 hours. Um, unfortunately, it's not on Android yet, so I haven't uh, been able to see myself whether it's worth the hype. Um, but that's that's in soft launch. It's going to soft launch on Android, and then they'll do um, a big marketing push. So this is about creating a mobile game that is appealing to a broad range of, uh, of gamers, um, and people are going to come play this game as a gamer, as something they want to engage with because you know the influencers they follow on YouTube um, are playing this game. Um, it's the sort of gameplay they like. PVP. Um, and then within that experience, there's the option to opt into the blockchain side, um, giving added value to players you know, who like trading assets, who perhaps like acquiring some special rare collectible assets. Um, so I, I think in terms of you know, attracting users, it's about creating an engaging experience, having that value add there to you know, engage with the blockchain side of things. I'm, Robbie mentioned earlier as well, you know, if you want to appeal to particular market segments, uh, you know, like so crypto enthusiasts, have a way to do some yield farming to earn fungible tokens. Um, but really, it's it's adapt to your audience. Um, but for now, I'd say it's about drawing in people who uh, aren't knowledgeable about the space. And a lot of the engine games have a way to you know, the game, experience the game without needing to you know, download a blockchain wallet, without needing to engage with blockchain assets. But at any time, you can withdraw the items you've earned onto the blockchain. And uh, some of the games are kind of you know, pointing out, oh, this, this item you just found, it recently traded on this marketplace for this value. And people are going to think, wait a minute, OK, how do, I, how do I acquire that value? How do I become part of this marketplace? Um, and then they're incentivized to go through that sort of, those education steps. Thank you. Thank, thank you a lot for your input. Philip, would you like to add something? Um, I don't know if there's much to add other than, yeah, I, I really think if you want to bring people into your game, there's, you know, there's, you need to market like other games to traditional marketing. Like, uh, uh, it comes down yeah. to like a lot of ads and a lot of, you know, promotion on Twitch and whatever. But if you don't make a good game, it's going to be very difficult to bring on a lot of players, right? You might be able to attract some niche, what are that niche is people from blockchain. Uh, but if you want to attract the masses from gaming, you're going to have to, to make a really good game. Uh, I, I don't think there's other secrets to that. Thank you, thank you. So we have around uh, 10 minutes left before the end of this season. There is already a question came in and we have three topics to discuss. So for the next topic, we leave the gaming side aside and we discuss about the digital identities. Can NFTs become the backbone of digital identities? I know Vladimiros would like 
to share his input about this topic. So, Vladimir, you can begin, please. Yeah, that's a pretty, pretty interesting, uh, interesting concept, especially when we pretty much everyone uses Web3 wallets uh, to interact with dApps and everything. Uh, from one standpoint, you could say that uh, a, web, a, a good Web3 wallet can be used as your digital uh, identity. But I think that um, NFTs bear something more, but not in the form they are at the moment, because I think that we would need something like uh, a combined version of an NFT with an entity, a non-transferable token. And that's uh, for the reason that, um, well, when I think about digital identities, it's not just your picture and your credentials stored in an NFT. It should be something more that verifies that you are 100% who you say you are. And some concepts we're exploring with a Russian bioinformatic firm called Xenom is uh, actually, you know, storing your uh, genome sequence into an NFT and then adding some extra bits of code to make that NFT non-transferable. And that means that I can verify that uh, this wallet, for example, is mine since it bears my genome. And uh, I, since I cannot transfer it, you know, you can avoid uh, malicious actions such as sending, let's say I do a DNA sequencing, I send my DNA to your wallet and then I claim it's mine uh, with a second sequence. So we really need to rethink, I don't think maybe it's not even possible with NFTs, nor none with uh, entities either, but we need a, a new protocol for that. I've talked about this with the creator of the ERC721, and he told me he, he tried to work on the ERC-1238, I think, which is currently uh, under development as badges, uh, as non-transferable badges that should, I guess they try to use them for licenses or some experience points or like, oh, this guy uh, has 1000 Ethereum transactions or badges like that. So I think that's close to something that could be used for a digital ID uh, in your uh, crypto wallet, but uh, we're still far away from that. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Do you guys believe that we're really going to use NFTs, like digital identities? Can we trust this? I mean, I've seen data changing on the blockchain all the time. Get it? See a non-fungible token, they change the images, they change the description. I guess they, they can't change the unique code, but Things are changing. Do you think it's safe? Are we going there? I, I think um, well, obviously there's options to you know, put that metadata on the on on a sort of permanent immutable solution itself. Um, I, I think the issue that we actually would have is that people have multiple identities. So theoretically, if if I was a, a master of the Kim Kardashian dress up game, and theoretically as as getting your know, high scores all the time. You know, I'd want to show that off to a specific segment of, of my friends uh, and my sort of online pals. Um, and that wouldn't be the people I'm playing Mortal with. Uh, you know, Mortal, I'd want to you know, show off a different set of NF uh, NFT achievements, a different set of NFT collectibles. Uh, so I think as a more intermediary step, it'll be interesting the solutions that come along that allow us to showcase specific uh, wallet um, collections, specific NFT collections in different ways. Um, and I think that will kind of that, that element will tie into sort of user profiles um, and digital identities a bit more. Um, but I think you might be kind of looking more at kind of government level authoritative <laughs> side of things. Yeah. But I think digital identity for me is uh, your, your possessions. It's why people spend so much money on Fortnite. It's your cultural capital that makes up who you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, anyone would like to add something here? We can move. No. Okay, well, let's move. Uh, so, can you please? I was just gonna say, these are anywhere in the near future, and the, people are buying usernames, and I think that's different from having an identity. But your username, we can figure out yes. what it is, and we can easily get uh, people's profiles. But for uniquely identifying people, the world hasn't even done that in a centralized way. There's no, there's, it, you, you'd be able to, if, unless everyone in the globe is covered, you can find somebody whose ID is not registered and take it. So it's a very tough problem and not yes. in the scope of yeah. anything that anybody's working on that I know of, really. It will take some years. It, it will need to change the infrastructure, first of all. Okay, guys, so 
what are some underrated NFT use cases beyond hmm. crypto collectibles? Who would like to begin? Talk me about the use cases. Oh, I can. Uh, uh, go. Please. Sorry, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll just go quick. So, uh, Alex, Alex, yeah, start. I think a very underrated use case for NFTs is like a waitlist token or just the ability to claim uh, access to something that cannot support tons of users yet. Um, like Polyant Games is, is in a way doing this now. Mailbox got really famous for doing this uh, back in, I think it was like 2010 to get people to sign up for its waitlist for this email client. Um, there are lots of cool types of waitlists that we've seen pop up and they're important. And it actually, and it makes sense to enforce scarcity for them. And it makes sense to make that scare, that those uh, access tokens tradable. So uh, I, I don't see a lot of people doing digital or NFT software licenses. Um, and I don't see a whole lot of waitlist tokens but they have good market cap. They make total sense, super underrated. That's one of my answers. They, they exist, the, at least the membership tokens uh, do exist, uh, right, Alex? I think uh, Simon was doing that with uh, the membership tokens in Engine. Uh, I, yeah, yes, my, my metaverse. metaverse. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I got one token, that one, and it, it's great. I mean, the membership, it's great. You just have the token and you can access the website. It's as simple as it sounds, right? I mean, if you could lend that token and take it back in a year, that's a fully subscription system, right? It works. Okay, so uh, Vladimir, would you like to... Yeah, uh, I think uh, there are already a lot of good NFT use cases, like besides like... I, I couldn't say that they are alternative to crypto collectibles since they are all based on uh, some sort of a blockchain. They are all tokens, like different forms of tokens uh, in the form of a smart contract. But I think like besides the traditional stuff, we see like art and some Microsoft Paint trolls and some uh, gaming uh, items or uh, stuff like this. I think uh, we start to see more and more uh, uh, like in-depth artistic uh, fields coming into blockchain and knowing exactly what they want. I see a lot of guys from the music industry, uh, even big labels, especially in the electronic scene that start to grasp, uh, you know, maybe they don't understand the basics of blockchain, but they do understand that they can create an economy based on scarce musical audible files, uh, something that they already did with the vinyl uh, industry like the record vinyls, they were something like NFTs. You know, you print 300 vinyl, you name the price, and then only 300 users around the world can own one and listen to the specific track. And uh, I think that, you know, the NFT space uh, explodes really fast and we see from day to day new implementations, we see unlockable files, uh, we see event tickets, we see proof of attendance uh, tokens, and all this stuff are really, really interesting. Like, I don't think we're going to be, uh, you know, uh, pressured to stay just in the artistic field or in the blockchain gaming field. I think NFTs, like anything, uh, practically can be tokenized. Wait. I, I'll, I'll anything. I think also something that's just more of a meta concept is the idea of sharding as well. Um, because I think mm -hmm. when we take all these potential use cases and then add the idea of fractional ownership, whether it can be... Uh, um, you know, having a, a fractional ownership of some kind of a membership token or an ownership token, um, just the idea of being able to enable fractional ownership in general across the ecosystem, I think that's already quite quite game changing. Agreed, agreed. It is. Fun, funny thing, I was talking about this uh, a few hours ago about a guild in a blockchain game which uh, uses land. And we were like, uh, okay, in order to be safe, we should be able to own these pieces of land altogether. Yes. I can trust you, this one. You can, <laughs> trust this, you can trust this to me either. So we need both to control this. Okay. Anyone would like to add any other underrated use case? Or we are good to move. Okay. So we have two questions left and 30 seconds. 
and one question to answer to the public. So I'll be we quick. Have, we also have a question in the Q&A. Uh, yes, we, we, we will do this. Uh, guys, is it cost efficient to use non-fungible tokens? What is yeah, it? Or, or what? Is it cost efficient to implement non-fungible tokens inside the game? Do we need extra work there? Do we need extra people or just we take the unit SDK, for example, and go there and implement? I, I can take this really short. I think it's a super good question. We spend most of our time thinking about this. Like we've been trying to move as much of the process off chain as we can so that uh, developers don't have to pay gas. And so sellers don't have to pay gas for selling. Now we have English auctions where you can do gas-free trades uh, where OpenSea pays the gas. And what I think, uh, as Philippe was talking about earlier, what will eventually become a big deal is is layer two. And we're working on this right now. Um, we want it to be efficient for developers to use non-fungible tokens. And even without layer two, like we, we've made smart contracts that let you sell things without having to mint them. So they only get minted when the first person buys them. And that's kind of a, a crucial step we found to get a lot of developers into the space is that they can use like our factory contracts to really quickly sell things without having to pay a mint anything. Okay, great. Thanks for the input. Uh, anyone would like to add something? Okay. So uh, tell me guys, can players become full-time gamers in the future or just the pro ones, the popular streamers with blockchain gaming and NFTs? Can I make money playing games? I think I can. What do you guys think? Well, if I can. You can definitely make more money. <laughs> yeah. You, I, 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 <laughs> um, oh, go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you can definitely make more money. There's more ways to monetize. And you can also, if, if you look, there's, there's the gamer element sort of as a, as a sort of amateur or pro athlete. And then there's the gamer element as an entertainer, you know, create, creating let's play videos and NFTs. You give all these scenarios where you can, you can have branded NFTs, you can have fan NFTs, you can have collectibles, you can be a distributor of special assets as an influencer and um, using QR codes to distribute assets in a game. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on in terms of I'm based in Berlin, there's a big esports um, scene here. Uh, pro game game for six days of the week. Um, you know, they're, they're locked in a house with their teammates. Um, these people are athletes. You know, they're on special nutrition programs. They've got in-house chefs. Um, it's 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 like the the sort of professionalization of the football scene. Um, and when you see professional gamers play, they're doing things you know, I, it would take me years and years to learn how to do. But I think what uh, blockchain assets do is they make this a big industry. They allow more people to participate in the marketing, in the influencing, in uh, terms of monetizing that experience. Uh, but it's it's a huge open-ended question there. Yeah, it's true. Uh, Philip, you would like before to add something? Yeah, sure. I, I definitely think that one of the major benefits of having blockchain in games is that it makes the economy much, much bigger, right? Now, it's not just close to one single entity. The economy can really scale to, to the entire world. And so if there's more money, there's definitely more money to be made and more participants will be able to make money. But I still don't think that if, you, if you're just a regular Joe that plays a little bit of every few hours and you're not spending money, you know, you won't become rich by playing blockchain games. You can't print infinite money to everyone at the same time. It's going to get exploited, right? So uh, I, I really think there's going to be more opportunities for people to make money in gaming, whether it be at renting, yeah, to unit club. Hmm? Say, what did you say? say, say hmm? I said say that to Uniswap that you can pay everyone, you can make everyone rich to spend money. Well, yeah, you can, but that was <laughs> once, right? And it's one billion dollar, but one billion dollar is not enough for, or I think, one hundred fifty. What is it? Five hundred million? But it's not enough to 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 pay the entire world constantly, right? It was a one-time thing to a very small number of players. Uh, yeah, I mean, wow, solved by just farming gold. Eventually, you leave, it leads to hyperinflation. You can give infinite assets. It just doesn't work. So I, I, st I think there's going to be a lot of ways to make money in the future that are not existing today, but I still don't think most players will be able to live off just playing video games. 
So that's good news. So uh, that was all the questions. It's time to move on to the QA. If you guys have any questions, now it's time to write them. So I'll begin with the first and only which, from JK, which says, so with current congestion, where are scaling solutions? NFTs are going to be low value, high velocity assets, and this will require some kind of lawyer too. What are solutions now? JK says. So guys, what are some solutions? Side chains, for example? Could this... Well, I mean, over at Engine, over at Engine the, the final part of that offering is Efinity, our own scaling solution. Um, and that will be rolled out across all the Engine products, the, the wallet, the Explorer, the marketplace. Um, and yes, this will be the this will provide a, a full loop e a full loop ecosystem uh, for people to receive and send and trade um, and loan and rent um, their NFTs uh, with you know, fast transactions and low or no fees for the average user. Um, and I think at that point you can have uh, loads of things be NFTs. Um, perhaps uh, not immediately every single bullet capsule, but uh, I think this is yeah this is really about having lots of tokens, having people playing around with. Okay, it got, it got stuck for a minute. Thank you, Alex. So uh, basically there are some yeah. other solutions right now, like Matic, for example, and all that stuff. But Alex, when when is Infinity coming? I mean, I've been waiting for Infinity for a long time. Uh, it's definitely, definitely the, the question that the, the engine community asks um, all the time. I think, uh, I don't think we've had publicly, we've made uh, the timeline public yet. So I don't think I'm approved to make it public here. So apologies to all the engine community who've sat through the whole panel waiting for <laughs> this. Um, but uh, obviously it's, it's really needed. Um, and we've got all of this DeFi activity on Ethereum um, and it, it makes sense to pay high gas fees when you're seeing high returns. Uh, but for the NFTs, there's workarounds at the moment, but we really need a scaling solution. And this is, this is the, this is the answer. And this was always in engine sites. This is why we're providing an ecosystem that, you know, a scaling solution can be laid on top of, um, and still grounded in the, you know, the core security of a base blockchain, uh, that people can return the assets to, can still benefit from the composability of the blockchain there. So, um, yeah, those, those are all the components that need to be, be taken into account for a scaling solution. And um, you don't want to leave the, the mothership too far. Thank you. So we have another one question from Alex Kova. And he says, how safe is it to own high valuable non-fungible tokens? Is it legally protected in case of extortion and others? Well, I guess that depends on how cryptocurrency is regulated in your country, Alex, right? I mean, it's an NFT. You own the NFT. It's in your wallet. If they don't know it, it's still yours. I think that's the same with physical items. Like, you know, if you boot uh, something, uh, nobody can uh, assure you that you will be able to buy, uh, to sell it, you know, for a, for the same or even a higher value. So if you buy something, you the deal is, uh, is uh, ending there at that transaction. Like if you want to resell it or to gift it or to transfer it, uh, that's an, uh, a totally different story. So I think the same applies to NFTs, like since they're always on chain, always in your wallet, uh, the value is not something that, you know, nobody can promise you that you buy something and you will be definitely able to sell it in 10 years or uh, whatever. Okay, cool. Uh, do you have any other questions, guys? I don't see any other in the QA. So I think we are good. Thank you for watching this. Uh, thanks to all the speakers. Nice to meet everyone, guys. Today. Nice to, nice to meet you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Have fun and keep innovating, guys. Hopefully see you in Ukraine next year. Okay. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Thanks for having us. Take care, guys. Rest well, guys. Thank you.